who is Damien Eccles? And what does he share with all of us? This is not a celebrity name, actually. I don't expect you to know who Damien Eccles is, so it's one of those rhetorical questions in which I'm now going to tell you about Damien Eccles. And on the one hand, Damien Eccles has had a life dramatically different from the life each of us has had. In a certain sense, he could hardly be more different from your experience or my experience. But on the other hand, Damien Eccles taught me something about one of the most fundamental, universal, deepest aspects of what it means to be human. And you know, it's not anything I hadn't known before, but like, and it's not anything you don't know, but like so many things in our life, things come along occasionally to make the point all over again. This is Damien Eccles. This is a picture of him. That's not a stained glass. It looks kind of like a stained glass, but in fact, that's kind of up against a graffiti wall. This is Damien Eccles as he looks now. Damien Eccles was put in jail for 20 years for something he did not do. I was visiting with my son Brian last summer in Vermont, where he was in a master's program in Vermont at, um, in creative writing. I, I visited him up there, and while there, he and I had an opportunity to go together to hear Damien Eccles talk, because he has written a memoir, and this was about his memoir and about his life. And you know, it was one of those things that I went to because it sounded somewhat interesting, and I went to because my son and I were, were uh, interested in this together, but what I actually experienced in that couple of hours was a really powerful reminder of something very strong in all of us. Damien Eccles was a young kid in Arkansas who ran afoul of the justice system. And this story is a story about a lot of things, and one thing it's about is about the justice system. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. He was a young kid, 18 years old, a smart aleck, and a kind of a drifter, a dropout. You can see him in this mug shot. You know, he kind of has the attitude, even this picture, doesn't he? So he had long hair and he had some tattoos and he had some strange behavior, but he wasn't very much unlike lots of kids at that age. But in the community where he was a part, West Memphis, Arkansas, a horrible crime occurred and three young boys were murdered. The town was incensed, obviously, and angry and fearful, and people didn't know what had happened, and mothers were locking their kids up after school, you know, making them stay home because they didn't know if there was somebody out there killing little boys, but just tremendous pressure in the community to find somebody, arrest somebody, convict somebody, for heaven's sakes. And Damien Eccles kind of wandered into this scenario and he looked a little strange and he wasn't quite one of the, you know, all-American kids that <clears throat> went to high school and played in the band and, you know, went to Sunday school and he was, lived in a mobile home with a couple of his buddies. Who, he was kind of a fringe kid. <clears throat> and Damien and his two buddies were arrested for that crime. Very, very thin circumstantial evidence and one of the guys was thrown in a cell. Now, you've heard stories about this a lot. He's thrown in a cell and interrogated and all night long and broken down. And this guy was a young man with a measured IQ of 78 who was just sort of borderline able to even stand trial as a, an adult. And this kid, this young man confessed. 
He said, yeah, we, I did it. Yeah, a couple of my buddies were with me. And the next thing you know, Damien Eccles is being convicted and sent to prison for life without parole and at first to death row for a crime that it later turned out he did not do. Now what I learned from Damien Eccles' story is this. It's a story about how precious one's freedom can be. I read his memoir after I met him and heard him that day. You know, and his memoir is not so much about the crime. He doesn't even talk about that because he said, I have no knowledge of the crime. I don't know any more about it than you do. It's not even really that much about life in prison, or he was in prison for almost 20 years. It's really a story about how precious one's freedom can be, how much one takes it for granted until one loses it. And when you hear this guy talk, although he's very low-key and very soft, he's not angry, he's not loud, but somewhere in that soft, reserved style, there's this passion for life that he's missed out on. And he talks so eloquently about what it means just to be free. His life story is a story of trying to not give up until he gained his freedom. He was the kind of guy that constantly wrote. He was on 23-hour lockdown. For 16 years, he was on 23-hour lockdown. That means he was in a cell by himself for 23 hours every day. He got out one hour to take a shower and do some exercise, interact with a few other inmates. While he was on that lockdown, he said he never lost sight of one thing. I want to be free. I want to get out of here. I just want to walk down the street. I just want to go to a shopping mall. I just want to visit a fast food restaurant. I don't want much out of life. I just want to be able to wake up in the morning and decide what I'm going to do today. I just want to look forward to the weekend knowing I'm going to get off from work. I just want to be free. And he describes with such quiet passion this motor that was in him that never turned off year after year after year in Arkansas State Prison, in which he looked at like there was no hope. His appeals were denied, nothing good was happening, but he kept doing everything he could. He wrote letters to celebrities. He wrote letters to judges. He tried to find some way to get somebody to pay attention to him and to say, we did not do this. And finally, the wheels meshed. Interestingly, you know, and, and a, a documentary maker heard his story and decided, from Europe, I want to come do a documentary on this guy's life. And she did a documentary on his life. And, you know, nobody saw the documentary much. It, you know, it played in a few film festivals and on European television. But Johnny Depp saw the documentary. Now, I don't know much about Johnny Depp. Seems like a very strange customer to me. You know, like the hair. I'd like to do Johnny Depp hair for one day or two. Uh, Johnny Depp saw the documentary about the West Memphis boys that got in prison, and he thought they were innocent, and he decided he'd going to go to bat for them. And he started going, he went out there and visited them, and, and then he got in touch with other celebrities. And they finally they got some attention, and they raised a bunch of money, and they hired some more lawyers, and they finally got a new trial. And then after 18 years in prison, DNA evidence surfaced that absolutely cleared him. And he got his freedom back. This is a shot of him leaving prison or soon after he was out of prison with a young woman who became his wife. And, uh, and he now lives in Massachusetts, a quiet life in which... He says, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be rich. I just want to be free. I just want the ordinary things, in other words, that before he went to prison, he took for granted. The story of Damon, Damien Eccles illustrates one of the most powerful forces in human life. In a very, very dramatic way, it was in him but in a very real way, it's in all of us. That same motor, that same fire, that same thing that wouldn't let him rest until 
he found a way to gain his freedom is in each one of you. It pushes you toward freedom. It's part of the way you, we are engineered. It's a gift of God. The drive for freedom is built into every human being. It's part of the wiring. It's not an instinct quite, because human beings don't really have instincts, but it's such a strong primal impulse. It certainly looks like an instinct and feels like an instinct. And what it does is it creates the energy for all kinds of powerful accomplishments. We see these photographs from Ukraine. I don't understand the, I don't understand the politics of Ukraine at all. I don't know who's on, who's out, who's good, who's bad. I'm just gonna wait till it settles down try to figure out who the good guys are. But I do know one of these, this, in all the turmoil of Eastern European politics, there is one theme that lines through all of it, and that is the desire people have to be free from somebody else telling them what to do. For the Ukrainians, it's the Russians. For the ethnic Russians in Ukraine, it's the Ukrainians. Everybody wants to be free, and everybody wants to determine their own fate, and everybody wants some kind of independence, and that's not just true in socio-political and cultural ways, it's true in intensely personal ways, and it's never truer than when you're in college. You might as well put a bumper sticker on your car, all of you, when you get 18 and go off to college, I'm out of here, here meaning home, not jail. But sometimes it feels like jail, life without all that parental interference. A little cubicle called a dorm room, home sweet home. Why do students by the millions leave comfortable bedrooms in their parents' homes and live in little cubicles called dormitory rooms and love it because along with the package comes the freedom. College is the biggest explosion of personal freedom that we ever experience in our lives. Finally, you get to get up when you want to get up, go to school if you want to go to school, miss class, make class, wear what you want to wear, be with who you want to be. And what happens is going off to college or going off to the military or going off to work or going off in a marriage somewhere in late teens or early 20s is the point at which this drive for personal freedom really reaches its apex. And so we not only use this energy to accomplish great things, this energy also can have a downside. Sometimes we can want to be free from parental influence or interference. We can want to be free from constraints. We want to be free from people telling us how to think. We want to be free from people telling us what the rules are. But sometimes along with all that, we decide we want to be free from things that really matter. Sometimes in getting free from things that would control us, setting our own path, living our own life, obeying that impulse that God put in us, sometimes we not only get free from the bad stuff, we get free from the good stuff. Freedom can have a downside. Back in my generation, there was a very famous lyric from a song. It was actually first recorded by Janis Joplin. I don't know if all of any of you remember Janis Joplin, but she was sort of a, uh, she was sort of a prototype of the uh, of the desire to live one's life one's own way. She sang a, a song called Me and Bobby McGee. It was covered by a lot of different people. My favorite version of it is Chris Christopherson, who's probably even more obscure to you than Janis Joplin. It's a great song. A lot of people record it. Me and Bobby McGee, do you know that song? There's a wonderful line from that song that says, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. It's like the prodigal son in the pig slop was free. Sometimes freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Matter of fact, Jan Jan Janis Joplin played that out all the way. She was the one that came on stage with a, with a bottle of Jack Daniels sometimes and would sing and hit on a bottle of Jack Daniels or Southern Comfort and and uh, she sort of determined to live way out there on the edge and uh, lost her life as a very young artist in a very tragic way because of substance abuse. But you know, her personal theme was this 
I'm going to be free from anybody setting boundaries for me. I'm going to be me. Not to talk about Janis Joplin, but it's kind of ironic to me that one of her songs that she's best known for is a song in which she said, yeah, it's almost ironic. Sometimes freedom just means you're lost out there. There's a psychologist named Eric Fromm who talks about this. And if you've been in my psychology class, you've heard me talk about this guy because he's one of the people I like to talk about. Eric Fromm's book that has sort of established his personal manifesto in his, his signature book, his magnum opus, is a book called Escape from Freedom. And the interesting thing about that title is, is the preposition from. We don't normally think of escaping from freedom. It's almost oxymoronic, isn't it? It's like, no, you escape from bondage. You escape from restraint. You escape to freedom. You escape to become free. But Eric Fromm says, no, what happens is sometimes you get so free that you're bound by your isolation. You're, it's cold out there in freedom land. <laughs> You want to push back from anything that might control you, and the next thing you know, you're way back. What he says is from that we live our lives first trying to be free from stuff, then trying to matter to stuff. We want to matter to somebody. We want to be connected somewhere. We, we don't want to be free anymore. We want to be known. We want to be depended on. In other words, we want to relate, the opposite of freedom. And I think when you come to college, everything collides. Everything conspires to make you want to set your own path, to think your own way, behave your own way. And we ought to stop at some point and say, okay, how free do I really want to be? Because freedom is the flip side of connectedness. Do we want to be free from God? I don't think so. Matter of fact, Eric Fromm said something very interesting. He said, people want to be totally free and then they never like it. He said, absolute freedom is absolute hell. Nobody really wants to be absolutely free because if he were to quote, Janis Joplin, it's just another word for nothing left to lose. Sometimes God-given things, including the drive for freedom, can be twisted into forces of destruction, and I've seen it play out that way in the lives of a lot of Lee students. They want to push back from the rules, push back from parental control, push back from a narrow fundamentalist way of thinking, and I don't mean fundamentalist now in a theological sense, I mean in a much broader sense, push back from a kind of confining culture and set their own course, live their own life, think their own way, behave their own way, and that's terrific, but at, like so many other gifts from God, it can be turned into something bad. Because we can be bound not only by external forces, but by invisible things. Sometimes you don't want to be free. Sometimes being free is just another way of being on the road to hell. When my family lived in Boston, I had young kids. We lived in an apartment right in the middle of the city. My kids were elementary school kids. I was doing a postdoc up there. Cold winter, jeez, long, cold, hard winters. I don't really like pets. We couldn't have had pets in this little apartment anyway, but my kids started pressing me to have gerbils. They wanted gerbils. Daddy, why can't we have gerbils? All the other kids have gerbils. Gerbils are nasty little sort of simulated rats. And they live in these plastic boxes, and little kids that don't know better play with them. All right, I'm trying to be a hero to my kids. I want to tell them yes every time I can. So, okay, well, you can each get a gerbil. Oh, happy day. We all went down to the pet store and they each picked out a gerbil. And Vanessa called her gerbil Lancelot. And 
Heather called her gerbil Guinevere, and my son called his gerbil Fred. <laughs> he didn't have a lot of, you know, poetic thing going in. All right, this is okay for a couple of days, but after a few days, I got tired of these little gerbils. They started to stink. The kids didn't take care of them. We were having to clean out the curb gerbil house. It was a pain in the neck. I wanted to get rid of the gerbils. They only cost about two and a half bucks each, as I recall. So I kept trying to lobby my kids, let's kill the gerbils. <laughs> now, I didn't frame it that way, you understand, but then, let's give the gerbils to habitat or something, I don't know. Let's have a drawing, win a gerbil. I wanted to get rid of the gerbils. No, daddy, you can't get rid of the gerbils. I wanted to give the gerbils away. Oh, no, daddy, you can't do that to the gerbils. I wanted to get rid of these gerbils and my kids would have none of it until finally I hit upon the right stratagem. I said to my kids one night, you know, kids, everybody wants to be free. <laughs> Born free, as free as the wind blows. You remember that old? Your grandparents know that song. Everything wants to be free, and your gerbils want to be free. Let's give them their freedom. Let's give these gerbils freedom. Let's let these gerbils be free to go where they want to go, be what they want to do. Don't keep them in this little plastic box. If they want to live on this block, let them go to another block. Let's make our gerbils free. Free the gerbils. And my kids, being young and stupid, bought this. <laughs> so on one cold evening in a neighborhood with lots of hungry cats, <laughs> yeah, I'm ashamed of it, but I mean, you know. I mean. We had a little ceremony out back behind the apartment. It was one of those triple-decker apartments on a tight street in Boston. We went out and had a little ceremony, and I don't know, we might have prayed a prayer. I'm not sure, but we gave the gerbils their freedom. And you know, these stupid gerbils liked it, and so they ran off. Now I got to thinking about it. Those gerbils, they didn't stay alive six hours because they had no food, they had nobody to take care of them. They had the life of Riley living in our little apartment. We're feeding them, fluffing their pillow, talking baby talk to them. And then when they became free, what were they free to do? They were free to starve. That's what they were free to do. They were free to freeze to death. That's what they were free to do. They were free to get chased and devoured by a hungry cat. That's what kind of freedom we gave them. And that's the way freedom frequently is. You get free to do what? Free to mess up your life, free to get isolated, free to not have anybody care about you, free to make terrible mistakes, free to destroy something precious, free to not matter to anybody, free to drop out, free to be a loser, free to do whatever you want to do, but it, is that really what you want to do? So when we respond to this impulse to be free, we got to look at it with some degree of intelligence, say, okay, how free do we want to be really? And what do we want to be free for? Not just what do we want to be free from, because we can be bound by all kinds of external forces. We can want to be free from the rules and turn out being bound by substances or alcohol or addictions of all types. We can be free from college and just become a dropout. We can be bound by our obsessions. We can be bound by our negative relationships. We can be bound by our own weaknesses. You can walk around with absolutely nobody trying to tell you what to do and still be totally bound because there's something operating in the human spirit that's very strong and it operates alongside our desire to be free. And the Bible has a phrase for this thing and it's, it's kind of a dark phrase. The Bible calls this the law of sin and death. That's what the Bible calls it in Romans 8 too. There's this power inside us that's a part of our evil nature that God works to redeem us from. There's this power inside us that operates to take our freedoms and twist them and turn them against us and put us in chains. 
The Bible calls this the law of sin and death. It says the law of sin and death is that kind of entropy, that kind of constant deterioration of the good part of you that Satan conspires with, that Satan encourages, which Satan would like to give you the appetite for things that will bind you. Satan would like for you to find attractive relationships that will control you. Nobody who's bound by substances, and God knows there are millions in this country, and we, we see hundreds on the Lee campus over a period of 25 years. Students who will come to us in a counseling situation and acknowledge, I have a problem. Our rule here is that we don't respond to that in a, in a disciplinary way. If you go to a counseling center on the Lee campus and you say, I'm struggling with alcohol or I'm struggling with something else, whether it's a substance or a behavior, it can be an eating disorder, it can be cutting, it can be any kind of substance. If you go to seek help on our campus, we will try to help you on our campus and we will not respond in a disciplinary fashion. So if you say, I'm lonely and I'm struggling and I'm away from home and I found out that if I get a little buzz, I feel a little better. And so I'm, 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 I've gotten more and more into self-medicating with alcohol or whatever it is. You know, what, what, what is happening, and that's the story of so many people in so many places, including Christian people in Christian places. What's happening there is your desire for freedom and your ability to do what you want to do. Gradually, Satan takes it and turns it and makes it an instrument of your, of your captivity. So, you know, we've seen some tragic stories here at Lee where this sometimes reaches its final tragic result where people say, I can't get out of this trap. Where it's a relationship or behavior or substance or a reputation or whatever it is. The law of sin and death constantly works to pull us down, to feed the dark side of your life. Now, I know this is not a happy sermon on a beautiful spring morning, but you know, there is this law of sin and death that operates in the universe. Now, that's the bad news. Here's the good news. It's also a part of that scripture in Romans 8 and 2. It says this, for the law, there's another law, the law of life in Christ Jesus, the Bible calls it, the law of life in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, the freest individual who ever lived on the face of the planet. Jesus who knew the kind of freedom we can only dream of, that we can't even imagine. Because whereas we're bound by circumstances, he wasn't. We're bound by time, space, he wasn't. Freest individual who ever walked on the, place of the, on the face of the planet. And what he did was he gave himself up to the cross to be bound by men, hung on a cross. He died for us in order to put in place another law. The law of life in Christ Jesus. And this scripture says the law of life in Christ Jesus can make us free from the law of sin and death. That's real freedom. When you come to Jesus Christ and you say to him, I don't want to just be artificially free. I want my spirit to be free. I want to be free to be the kind of person I really want to be. I don't want to be jerked around by somebody else's opinion where I'm always scared to death. What do people think? I want to be free from that. I want to have the freedom to respond to God in a way that's natural and spontaneous and it doesn't have anybody else telling me what to do. Don't tell me when to raise my hand, when to put my hand down, when to say this, when to say that. Just affirm me when I do it. But if you're sitting by somebody who's personal power over you is so great that you can't be spontaneous in your expression toward God and then that you're not free to that degree. Jesus says, I want to I want to live to make you truly free, free to follow whatever dream you have, free to be whoever you want to be. And that's what living for Christ is all about. 
It's not about kind of ratcheting up our willpower till we finally please God. It's about coming to God and saying, you died to give me the gift of true freedom in Christ Jesus. And I recognize that I need it to experience true freedom. And that's what I wish for all of you. This will be the last time that I am up here in the role of a minister this semester and this year. And I always realize at a time like this that I won't see many of you again in this setting. We've got the biggest graduating class that we've ever had in the history of Lee, monster graduating class. All, the, all you guys, like Caleb and all the rest of them, I won't ever have a chance to talk with you like this. Many others, for various reasons, won't be back next fall. If you're back next fall, I'll be right in here yelling at you till you finally graduate. So what I want to say to you this, this morning is this. This motor in you that says the most precious thing in life is for me to be me, live my life, dream my dreams, believe in what I believe in, look the way I want to look, understand what God has for me. That motor that's in you was put there got by God, but for it to work, you've got to give it back to God so that you can be free from the law of sin and death by the power of the law of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's it. Let's stand. Just before we pay, pray the college benediction, wanted to put this slide up of Austin Holland. We all know the story. And we know that he's in a hospital at Erlanger right now and he's in very serious condition and he needs your prayers. So keep him and his family in your prayers and let's don't let go of him before the Lord. And we'll try to keep you updated on his condition. Uh, there's no real significant update at this time. You know, I really love you very much. Irrationally sometimes. Especially since I don't even know you. I'm not your mama, but I feel like your mama. I don't feel like your daddy. I feel like your mama. It's testosterone deficiency. <laughs> and here's what I want for you. I want you to go have an Easter weekend, have a great time, be cool, stay safe then I want you to come back after Easter weekend and I want you to throw it in gear and, and drive toward finals like a winner and take every one of those opportunities and take it up a notch. So you hit final exams absolutely at your best. That's what I wish for you. Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you.